I'm going to ask you a question. Ever go out to, to dinner with 10 people? And, you know, the waitress comes past out all those menus and, and then comes back to you and says, uh, what would you like? Oh, not me. Uh, God, get everybody else. Huh? I just can't make a decision. Every time somebody else decides they want swordfish, you say, oh, that sounds so good. Somebody wants primer, oh, that sounds so good. Somebody wants brisket, oh, that sounds so good. And she gets back around to you. And you're still there saying, I just don't know, I, I just can't make a decision. I, 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 I just, you been there and done that? You got a friend like that? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> or wallpaper. We recently wallpapered a, a, a room in our house. Roberta would come home from the store with these big books. They are monster books. And look through all of these books for days. And then she'd take those books out and she'd come back home with more books. I'm saying, what is the problem? To so hold this border up here, then hold this up and let me look at it. What can you tell from a little bitty piece anyhow? Just cover the walls with something that's clean. That's all I want. I don't worry about the design of the pet. People just go through all kinds of, this is so, then you finally find out what you want. The suckers don't have it in stock. You know what I mean? <laughs> so you wait all that time. Decisions. A lot of people have a lot of trouble making decisions, but let me tell you, it really gets complicated when we consider this one question. So I want to talk to you about this for two weeks. What is the will of God for my life? Boy, do I, do I go get a new job? Oh, God help me, or do I stay in this lousy, miserable job that I hate every day? Shall I stay here, Lord? Come on. Shall I get married or stay single? If you have a choice. <laughs> pray about that. Sometimes we're praying about somebody that doesn't even know Jesus. Should I marry this person? No. Very clear in the word. You don't have to pray about that. Don't waste God's time listening to you moan about something he's made very clear in his word. When people get into thinking about the will of God, they do weird things. They get a lot of mysticism going. Let's get the mysticism out of this stuff. God's very clear and very plain. You see, the, the will of God for you has little to do with the past or the future. If we get that straight, it helps us tremendously. You cannot change the past. What's done is done. You cannot determine the future, but now is will of God time for you in your life. And the Bible is very clear about what it has to say to you. There's so many decisions you don't have to agonize over, you don't have to struggle with. Simple, straightforward answers. For instance, in John chapter 6, Jesus has been with a bunch of people. He has fed them a bunch of stuff. And of course, they're really hanging around wanting more miracles and more stuff. And Jesus said something to him about why he was here. And, and they said, what does God want us to do? What's the will of God for us? And Jesus said, this is what God wants you to do. Believe in the one he has sent. Now let's start right there. Because in a crowd this size, there's got to be some folks sitting here that have never yet put their faith in Jesus. I read a Timothy testimony just within the last two weeks. A guy that loved his wife so much 25 years ago, he said, okay, I'll go to church with you every Sunday. And he came to church with her 25 years here before he finally decided to plug into Timothy and he has met the Lord. Make a guy feel like a real failure. 25 years I've got to plead with this sucker to get him to come to the party. <laughs> he wrote this great testimony how grateful he is to know the Lord. His wife deserves a medal. <laughs> she loved that guy 
and be such a wonderful example that he would continue to come to church until finally he met the Lord. Buddy, don't wait 25 years. If you haven't yet come to Jesus, if you haven't put your faith in this one whom God sent, get on with it. Had a guy tell me last week, would you go see my dad? He's sick. And he's lost. I said, give me his name and phone number. That's all I need. And I called the old boy Friday. Told him who I was. He said, I know who you are. <laughs> well, I don't know who you are, but I'm willing to find a... I said, can I come over? He said, sure. I went to his house. And I said, tell me what's going on. He said, well, I got cancer. And one of these days, I'm going to make a trip, and I'm not ready for the journey. Hallelujah, man. I mean, this guy's ripe. He's ready to get ready. And when I said, all right, let's get it done, and, and I explained the gospel to him, and he was he's very deep in thought as I'm talking to him. And I want to get a little hot shot. You know, get a little hot shot, a little electric... Huh? But he kept answering the questions. And finally he said, okay. I know what I want to do, but I don't know how to do it. I said, we can do that. All we're going to do is pray and invite Jesus into your life. He said, I don't know how to do that. And I did something I very seldom do. I said, I will pray and you follow me line by line. And so he did. And we got down to the end of that prayer and I said, and Lord, help me to tell my wife and my kids what I've done. Amen. You know, two minutes later, his wife walked in. She hadn't been in that room 20 seconds. He turned and said, you've brought me to God, Sally. Well, Hallelujah. He's already paying off on what he prayed and said he would do. And he said, no problem. I'll be happy to tell my kids. See, now maybe you're one of those. Start doing the will of God by believing in the one that God has sent, even Jesus Christ, as your Savior, and allow him the privilege to become your Lord. Have you done that? That's the good question to start with. When you begin to read in the book of Romans... In verses, in chapters 1 through 11, the Apostle Paul very clearly lays out what to believe. The plan of God for us. It's beautiful. But he gets to chapter 12, and he begins to tell us how to behave. And he starts that behavior deal with saying this, Give your bodies to God. Let them be a living and holy sacrifice, the kind he will accept. When you think of what he's done for you, is this too much to ask? Don't copy the behavior and customs of this world, but let God transform you into a new person by changing the way you think. Then you will know what God wants you to do, and you'll know how good and pleasing and perfect his will is. A lot of folks are scared of the will of God. They're afraid it's going to be something bad. How can a good God want something bad for you? He wants something good for you. And he lays it out so simply, you don't have to go to a special class on how to find the will of God. People always want to go study how to find the will of God. <laughs> Man, it's so simple. It's like the nose on your face. It's right in front of you. Don't miss it. Here he says, give him your body. Give him your brain. And when you give him your body, including your brain, your mind, you will find that you'll know what God wants you to do day by day, and you'll know how good and pleasing and perfect his will really is. Now, next question. How are you doing with this one? 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, 16. Always be joyful. Christian, hello, always be joyful, keep on praying, no matter what happens, always be thankful for this is God's will for you who belong to Christ Jesus. Now things in your house may be upside down, your kids may be raising so much hell, 
that every, every day is just terrible in your house. It may be that and you say, what is this? He says, be joyful, keep praying, and be thankful. You say, Buf, you don't understand. Tell me I don't understand. I raised six kids. More than you got. Okay? I understand the pressures. I understand the problems. I understand when mutiny happens. Huh? And you don't know what to do with mutiny? God says very clear, be joyful, be prayerful, be thankful. See, the will of God is that you be thankful. Then you may say, like Paul Verberg was with us last night. Paul is a, is a missionary out in the Philippines. And that's where Trevor and Amy went for almost a year. And Mitch and I have been there and several other folks have been out there to visit them. And they're doing a wonderful work. He and his wife, Margie, and their two little boys, and they came home on furlough here a few months ago, and Margie's pregnant, and they found a lump on Margie's breast. They decided two months ago, two months before that baby was to be born, we need to take the baby early. And Vicky's doing good. She's 10 pounds and doing good today. <laughs> But they had to remove that breast. And she's into chemotherapy now. Margie is. That's a hard time. You know, it's easy to say, what does Sam Hill's going on, Lord? We're out here knocking ourselves out in the Philippines. We've committed ourselves to serve you no matter what. How's this stuff land? Look, folks, it rains on the just and the unjust. You got that straight? We don't live in some immunity deal where nothing can touch us. You're going to hear some idiot preacher tell you someday, you just stay in the center of God's will and nothing can touch you. The heck it can't. can ride all over you. But he says while you're in the middle of that, be joyful, be prayerful, be thankful I am going to be a thankful person through my tears and through my sweat and through my struggle. I am not going to let Satan take that away from me. How you doing? Huh? How you doing? It's time to stop and say, how you doing? On 1 Thessalonians 5, 16, 17, and 18. You see, the will of God is not something we discover. It is something that we do. We obey. So simple. Look, look what Jesus said in Matthew 22. He said, you must love, you Christian, you must love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, and all your mind. That's the first and greatest commandment. And the second is equally important. Love your neighbor as yourself. How are you doing on those? You don't need a class on how to discover the will of God. You need to look at Matthew 22 and say, how am I doing? Am I loving God with all my heart and all my mind and all my soul? And do I love that miserable, rotten, no good neighbor that lives to the west of me? <laughs> or do I hate his guts? Do I throw my garbage over the fence? <laughs> do I do things that just tick him off? Folks, this is the will of God. This is the will of God. <laughs> That we love God, heart, mind, soul, and neighbor as self. How we doing? Huh? Hello? How we doing? Doing any good? Huh? You see, there's no agony in discovering the will of God. The difficulty is in doing the will of God. Look what Jesus said in John chapter 15 to you believers. He said, believers, I command you to love each other in the same way that I love you. Holy cows. I know some believers i just soon ship out. Do you? Huh? I know some people I pray for grudgingly. I'm still praying for them. But it's hard to get them into my prayer time. Now, this little confession may upset some of you, but if I get up here and act like I'm God Almighty, you're going to go home and say, I know he isn't. <laughs> the command is to love each other 
And Jesus said, you're to love each other in the same way I love you. The problem you try to sort out often between believers, the time you spend as the pastor trying to sort out that stuff, it's time you just think, I could be out winning somebody to Jesus while I'm trying to get these goofy believers to get along with one another. Just do what Jesus said. That's the will of God for you. You see, Jesus knew what his mission was on this earth. One of the great pictures that hung in our home when I was a kid was that one of Jesus kneeling at that big rock in Gethsemane. I tell you, the photographer did a great job when he snapped that one. (laughs) Jesus is saying to his father, look, if there's any other way... I really don't want to go to the cross. Is there plan B? It's exactly what he asked his father. But you know, the scripture tells us that Jesus learned obedience. One of the most important things in the scripture to get through your head. He learned to be obedient to his father without ever being disobedient, but he learned to be obedient. And he closed that prayer by saying, not by will. But yours be done. Do you live with an attitude of not my will, but yours be done? The Apostle Paul, he said over in 1 Corinthians 9, 16, preaching the good news is not something I can boast about. I'm compelled by God to do it. How terrible for me if I didn't do it. I understand that passage. I tell you what, I do not understand this. I was 16 years old, had graduated from high school, and I knew that God wanted me to surrender to give my life to the ministry. Now, don't ask me how. I look at 16-year-old kids today, and I say, well, they're interested in driving a car and (laughs) girls. Well, we were interested in girls. I mean, that's not new, you know what I mean? You see, I don't understand how I knew all of that, except I knew that, and I committed myself to that at that point in my life, and I've never looked back, and I've never thought, what a dumb, stupid waste of my life. There's sometimes when you, when you endure the, the hassling of people because you are the pastor. You know, my buddy Sterling, he owns, uh, he owns rallies. We've been longtime friends, and when he bought rallies, he came one day and said, you know, the the main burger they have is a big Buford. That's from some guy down in the south that started rallies. I want you to come do a commercial. I said, sound like fun, and so I did that commercial. I got, a, of course, an anonymous letter, two-pager from a guy who basically said, don't, doesn't the church pay you enough money? You have to go out and do commercials to make a living? I didn't get a crying thing for doing the commercial except the fun of doing it. I had a good time. But you take a beating from some clown that doesn't have the guts to sign his name. You want to look for him. You want to find him somewhere. You know? You want to let him know a thing or two or three. Just irritation. Aggravation that you don't need in life. I'll tell you something. Don't ever commend me for preaching the gospel because my whole notion with Paul is what a terrible thing for me if I didn't do it. I love to preach. I love the privilege of opening the word with people. See, our problem is not that we do not know the will of God. It's that we do not do the will of God. Not ignorance, but lack of faith and stubbornness of heart. You'd be amazed at how many people, when I, last September, preached those two messages on tithing and asked for 100 new families in this church to commit themselves to tithe. I got 122 now, thank the Lord. So many of those letters that came, not people saying, oh, thank you, Pastor Buth, this is a marvelous revelation to me. It's people writing and saying, 
I have known all along I ought to give God what belongs to him, but I didn't believe I could make it on 90%. Well, that's not trusting God. God simply says, give me what's mine, and you'll find the 90% will make it. And it works. It works. People are finding out it works. Here's our problem. It's wrapped up in three things, past, present, and future. You see, we misunderstand the biblical concept of time. God dwells in eternity. Now listen carefully and grab hold of this. God dwells in eternity. He is not bound by time. Our lives are bound by time. With God, there's no past or no future. All times are present with him. But with us, we're bound by time. And our past is full of decisions that have current consequences. We cannot undo what we did. We can only anticipate the future, but we can only live in the present. Are you getting the drift? See, it's the past and the bad decisions. It's the future and the anxiety that sets up because of the future that causes us not to live now. Scripture says, God is speaking... 2 Corinthians chapter 6, he said, At just the right time I heard you. On the day of salvation I helped you. Indeed, God is ready to help you right now. Today is the day of salvation. Today is the day of decision. Bob Williams came in my office this week. Morning, old Bob. Leaving tomorrow and heading out there. Came in my office and he said, I just talked to Ronnie out there in Indonesia and you know all the problems they're having with money out there and we have been needing a new van and I've ridden in that van and it is a mess it's welded together and it's got duct tape and baling wire and holding it's a mess we can buy a thirty thousand dollar brand new van for ten thousand dollars I said what are you doing standing here he said, what do you mean? I said, go to Kathy and tell her to write you a check and get that money to Ronnie and get it bought before somebody changes their mind. See, that's God's will now. Oh, I will go to prayer and we'll answer that in about 30 days. 30 days, that price going to be back up. He got it bought. We just kind of leaving it open, figuring God's got some people that want to give some money to pay for that van. And uh, we know that'll be taken care of and trust the Lord for that. You see, see how we view time affects how we understand the will of God. Bad decisions in the past cause us to be preoccupied with the past and the regrets of the past. If I only hadn't have been drunk... I wouldn't have piled up and killed that person in that car. If I'd only really thought things through, I wouldn't have been so eager to get married that I made a poor decision that I have to live with every day. If only, if only, if only. When my daughter was killed, somebody said, if only she'd have been Three minutes ahead, she wouldn't have been at that intersection with the truck. You can't live in the world of if only, folks. You've got to live in the real world. And when we come to an understanding that if we dwell on the past, we soon believe that God's will has been missed and we're left out and he's going to penalize us all of our lives because that's what Satan will tell you and he's a liar. Accept the full forgiveness of God for whatever you've done. Let the blood of Jesus wash you clean, believer. Understand that God says, I have given you a clean slate. If you're in a lousy marriage, get to retrofy and get it fixed. Don't wait till it's so terribly, horribly bad you wind up in front of an attorney somewhere hanging it up. Go get it fixed. 
And if you're one of those people that says, well, God's will depends on a decision in the future, you're probably a person that lives with a lot of anxiety. Satan whoops you with the past and with the future. And the present's what we've got. Obey God now. And you will be empowered to continue to do the will of God. Do the will of God today. Get Romans 12 going today. Give him your body. Give him your mind. Let him think through your mind. And find out what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. God wants that for us. And then about tomorrow. You know what Jesus said about tomorrow? Matthew 6. You're supposed to read Matthew 6 every day this week. Here's 634. Jesus said, don't worry about tomorrow. For tomorrow will bring its own worries. Today's trouble is enough for today. Don't be borrowing on tomorrow's trouble. Now you work on Matthew 6. You think about Romans 12. And next Sunday I'm going to preach the second half of this message. And let's see what God wants to do by getting us into the present. Living and doing the will of God. Stand together. Let's pray. Father, I'm so glad for the privilege to be here and to preach your good word. I pray that folks would go home. Some need to go home thinking, boy, I've never taken that first step. I, I'm not in Christ. I've never trusted God. They need to pull a card right now and fill it out and stick it in a box and let us help them find their way to Christ this week. A lot of believers that blame everybody else in the world for where they are rather than look at themselves and say, my problem is I don't give my body to God and give my mind to God and I think crazy. I got a lot of stinking thinking going on in my mind that needs to get fixed. Father, my prayer is that you just overwhelm us with your grace and your forgiveness and your love and make us aware that you haven't run out of any of those great items. You can pour enough of that on us to absolutely give us a fresh start. To help us. Guide us. Give us the wisdom to know you're guiding and to do your will today. And I'll give you thanks and praise in the name of the living Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Thanks. Great to be with you. you Take care. Fantastic. Thank you. Thank you.